Hello, and welcome to the Randomly Generated History Club, where three non-historians pick a year at random and try to learn things about it. I'm Ant, and I'm here with my two friends, Anna and Will. Hi. Hi. So, this week we're talking about the year 652. Mm. Um, And as is tradition at this stage, tradition being uh, one episode, um, (laughs) I'd like each of us to give a three-word preview of what we're discussing today as a sort of a, a teaser to whet the appetite. Anna. Uh, what are your three words? My three words are Egypt, lentil, packed. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I, I'm invested already. Yeah, There's so much. To I unpack. love lentils. Yeah, uh, packed. What about you, Will? <laughs> uh, vengeance, dark king. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have read that romance novel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, for mine, I want to go with suspect Aryan dynasty. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Which is going to let people really ruminate for a while. This yeah. feels like very dangerous ground. Oh, no, 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 no. We, we go into depth about this later on. Okay. Oh, great. Good. Even better. <laughs> cool. Well, on to 652. All right. So for my segment that I researched this week about the year 652, by the way, uh, not a great year for lots of historical information, so I had to do a lot of digging. Um, but I'm actually going to talk about the Lombards, uh, which were a, a dynasty, a, 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 a sort of a people, um, sort of Germanic people we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk specifically about the Harodingian dynasty and its actually its downfall. Um, and in this year, in 652, uh, King of the Lombards, King Rothari, he dies after a 16-year reign. Um, and his son... Uh, Rodaldo. 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 <laughs> well, <laughs> can we get a confirmation on Rodaldo, please? I think the O at the end might be superfluous, okay. but let, let's let's stick with it. But uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> according to the sources you've read, is he called Rodaldo? He's got several pronunciations of his name okay. and several okay. descriptions. So some of them have a W in them, some don't. Um, and I just remember him as Rodaldo. Ro- it could be Rodaldo. <laughs> it could be Rodaldo as well, yeah. So um, Rodald or Rodald or Rodaldo. Um, you know, he was, uh, he was a successor and he, he, not to spoiler on it, but uh, basically he, he completely fucked it and ruined, <laughs> <laughs> ruined everything. Those are um, our favorite types of rulers. So, just as a bit of a, like a bit of history behind the Lombards, like who were they, where they came from. So, in the year six fifty two, this was post the sort of Roman collapse. This was after the Vandals came down, and along with them were this uh, tribe of people called the Lombards. Wait, so, hang, this is in France, right? Uh, start, yeah, started off from France okay. and came down. So, this was sort of a Franco-Germanic uh, group of people called the Lombards, called the Longbeards, and they had apparently some Nordic ancestry as well. And the reason they were called Lombards was because at some stage in their history, um, apparently some sort of vision said that they would take over the world, and mm. they sort of sided with Odin and things. They eventually did become Christian as well, um, but they were actually part of uh, the Aryan kind of uh, influence and persuasion. And I had to do some digging on Aryan uh, history, which was an extremely <laughs> weird thing to search through. That's a tough thing to have in your search history. Really tough. But the historical Aryans, we're going to completely disregard uh, the modern day incarnation. So, so the, the word meant something totally different. Totally different thing. But what these people did, they had a dispute about the sort of uh, understanding of Christianity, is the kind of at the heart of these people. And they believed that uh, Jesus was just like basically a dude that got uplifted to being a god rather than like this this you know he was god so this is the okay. sort of this is the big sort of schism between the sort of orthodoxy which was then later established and the sort of arian belief at the time of like you know god was paramount and all the rest so there's religious sort of differences there um and uh this didn't sort of come about until the sort of uh until constantine called this sort of uh this diet this this um heterodox um ecumenical council to say what was in scope and what was not in scope but the lombards kind of ignored it um but they uh, came down from franco germany and they took over northern italy and parts of italy um, because there's a massive vacuum from the romans and they uh yeah they effectively just brought sort of order into the chaos they were extremely violent um 
<laughs> Hang on, sorry. They brought order into the chaos, and they were extremely violent. Through extreme <laughs> violence. <laughs> yes, I think. I think what I think their brand of chaos was at least you knew where he stood, right? Yeah. You know, like yeah. you knew right. you were going to yeah. get. Whereas beforehand, you just it was completely luck of the draw was going to happen to you. And just to be clear, the Lombards were the ones who thought Jesus was just a dude who was yeah. elevated. Yeah, okay. exactly. So they're the yeah, ones yeah, yeah. with a kind of heterodox. No, they're they're they're, they're unorthodox. Oh, okay, so, okay. so the heterodox were the, the sort of the Christianity around the place, and okay. um, in particular, um, the Bavarians, which which will feature later on. Those, mm. those okay. Bavarians, they're coming along with their nice meats and beers, and also their <laughs> different different outlook on Christianity. Um, so Rodald, he 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 was in power for sixteen years and had this massive successful thing because he started off as just basically a small time Duke of Brescia in France, I think at the time. Classic, yeah. Um, and then sort of ups- upskilled himself, you know, b- <laughs> Skillshare. I'm not sure which. Uh, <laughs> he learned how to code. Yeah, there's so much these things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Real yeah. Bootstrap a lot of DIY, story. Yeah. absolute bootstrap story. But then he hands over to his son. I'm sure on the deathbed is like you know. <laughs> Rodaldo, <laughs> don't don't fuck this up. Um, but what he did do before he died is he actually uh, imposed these edicts, these edictus rothari, which were this sort of how you should treat your king and how I am the epicenter of power and through like me I've been appointed by God. So it's like mm. one of the earlier parts um, of like sort of. Uh, crystallizing power through the written law mm. of what you can and can't do. And then he handed over this sort of legislature to uh, Rodaldo or... No, I think canon- canonically it's Rodaldo. Oh, Rodaldo. From yeah, here yeah, on yeah, out, his is. name is Rodaldo. Um, handed over to him and uh, uh, he was a lecherous man allegedly. Okay. And he lasted six months. Hang on. Oh, I no. feel like you breezed past a lot there. So, And he was a lecherous man and lasted six months. Yeah, yeah. Like- so, so apparently uh, Rodaldo was uh, uh, very lecherous, and he ah. caused such an uproar amongst um, the the sort of noble nobility in the families that he is actually slain by somebody's uh, jilted uh, jilted husband of one of his lovers. Wow. Oh, I see. Okay. So he took the sort of Lombard. I'm assuming he had a long beard because that's what Lombard actually means. Yeah. Was philandering all over the shop and <laughs> uh, basically had his comeuppance within six months. There is wow. a typo in the historical record which says okay. which says he ruled for five years and 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 nine days or something, but really it means five months and nine okay. days. Wow, that's a a, quite a typo. Yeah, a significant yeah, it's a bit typo. Of a typo. Yeah. yeah, there's no there's no copy editing back then. But like all histori- historians agree that he was just like basically a blip on the. So thing. That's some potent lettery. Yeah, potent yeah. lettery. But the, what's really important about this is that because of his death, the Harandingian dynasty effectively died. It didn't have a, any any sons uh, in spite of his attempts philandering at, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. and so this is where the um, Bavarians come in because the Bavarians were backed by the orthodox sort of papacy and therefore were able to seize control by swearing allegiance to the sort of papal orthodox uh, uh, church and therefore seize and wrest control and sort of sets the scene going forward with the Bavarians in charge for a very short period in Italy onto the latter stages when Charlemagne takes over and then we sort of roll on into the sort of modern conquests of uh, more modern conquests of Europe. Okay. So this one hmm. inept Lombard yeah. has basically paved the way paved the way for all subsequent events. Wow. wow. So we owe all modern European civilization to his lechery. I <laughs> I think we can absolutely source it. Yeah, back let's to boil it right yeah, down to that. Hundred percent. Yeah, and and so I think I think what I've learned from this is uh, don't be a bad king. <laughs> a summary. A big big good summary. And there. I promise I won't be. <laughs> <laughs> well, now see that is a really good uh, that opens it up for a question I have, which is the Rodaldo's father. Yes, Ro- Rothario. Rothar- Rothario. Yeah. He's not. He's, yeah, he's Rothario. 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 Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, he was the one who had the edicts about what you could yes. and couldn't do to his yep. king kinghood. Yep. What would you put in place? What I'm sorry, what will you put in place what when you I are king? Place? What when edicts can we expect? Edicts. What edicts can we expect from King Ant? Step one, my uh my car horn is is tethered <laughs> to a taser in your car. <laughs> <laughs> so should you cut me off in traffic you're getting taste you, I'm sorry, you is thought that, of that, is that so mu- quickly is that oh, mutual yeah. connection every, every way so oh, no, every no, car I, is connected to every other it's unidirectional for me but right. others can also participate in a subscription model oh, so maybe it should be based on like the feudal um, pa- oh, like yeah, yeah. power dynamic at play mm-hmm. under, mm-hmm. under the ant kingdom yeah where my dukes can also then right. you know with their knights underneath them, the knights with their, they with can their electrif- stable boys <laughs> yeah exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. and the peasants can tase no one yeah peasants can never Peasants may ta- be tased, but not tased. Yeah, okay, good, course. good, good. 
Reasonable. Yeah. 100%. Okay. Edict number one, smashed. I actually think that's just an improvement. <laughs> <laughs> At least there'd be some structure. I have been working on this patent for some time. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Well, I hope to have an elevated position in your kingdom because I don't want to get tased. <laughs> so what did you guys learn? Well, uh, I have learned quite a bit about uh, two fascinating characters from 7th century England. Mm. So I've uh, taken a look at uh, King Penda, of Mercia and King Oswiu of Northumbria. That's right. I'm going right. to need that one more time. Oswiu. That's right. <laughs> Pronunciation highly contestable. I'm going with Oswiu. Are you sure it's not Oswiu? O S O S W I U. Oswiu. Uh, so this is this is obviously um, as as you mentioned. You know, this is 250 years for the, for the, for Britain after the Romans have done one. Uh, <laughs> oh, the great done one. Yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. The great d- dunning one. Of- and, and 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 so by this time, the power structures in Britain have broken down completely into multiple competing kingdoms, and the uh, Angles and the Saxons are now very much around and vying for dominance. And so this historical period is called the Heptarchy because there are seven kingdoms, mm. four, four principal ones, all vying for dominance. And it's very Game of Thrones kind of time in the sense that... There were seven kingdoms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Literally. A little on the nose there, yeah, yeah, yeah. George. So, so I, think, um, uh, I think, what's his name? George R.R. R. Martin. That's the dude. Yeah. Like, I think actually, I suspect, you know, this, I suspect this, is, this was the, one of the main periods of inspiration for him alongside, it was the War of the Roses, wasn't it? Which is the other one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so like, uh, because it's just, as you say, it's so on the nose. But basically, each one of these kingdoms went through periods of really every few years or sometimes every few months, allying themselves with uh, one of the other kingdoms or two of the other kingdoms and then going for, to war against one of the other ones and try and and you saw this continual back and forth for decades and decades and decades where which eventually saw uh, pr- probably i think it's 150 years after this wessex then emerge as the dominant one mm. but at this time it was definitely um uh, definitely not clear who was going to uh going to be dominant in the end and this is a time also of like growing christian influence so the first archbishop of canterbury uh, had arrived in the uk about um 50 60 years before this so right so there's two key characters here penda from of Mercia and, and Oswiu of Northumbria. Oswiu. So I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a little bit about these about these two people because they're, they're pretty fascinating uh, human beings. So Mercia, so so uh, King Pender of Mercia. So this is uh, for people who don't live in the UK. This is the mod- This is uh, the Midlands of England, so the middle of England. And this is and, and by this time uh, he's been on the throne of Mercia for about thirty years. He took up, he took up that throne in his teenage years, so he's in his late forties. And he he is a dude who claims his lineage all the way back to mm. Odin and yeah. Woden. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. as he's called at the wow. time by these people. So he he is he claims this lineage back to the god, this pag- pagan god, as he would be there, be described by the uh, the Christians, and that's quite an important part of his of his mm. character. And he spent pretty much his whole reign, every few years, in quite a masterful way, uh, maintaining his dominance of the of Britain as like a political figure mm. by waging war against against his neighbours to keep them down, keep them split, engaging in alliances um, as necessary to do that. And he's made uh, and he initially made a name for himself right back in his teenage years by seizing some like some sub kingdoms some little tiny little tribal kingdoms down by the river the river seven in the uk no no quick question yeah <laughs> was he actually descended from odin <laughs> mm. I, I i think i think we can assume that that is is something he's made up maybe um, <laughs> but now if he were descended from odin and rodaldo is descended from odin are we talking about is, long lost cousins there here there's a conspiracy of royalty yeah. going back as far as odin <laughs> god it goes all the way to the top um yeah i don't know i mean i i think i think he we can probably agree he might have been incentivized somewhat to exaggerate his uh <laughs> His origin story, um, uh, but anyway, he's like no matter his origins, he's like was was definitely one of the most successful political figures for decades in the in England, if not until like Boris Johnson, obviously. Who <laughs> is who is descended from Odin? <laughs> yes, to be clear, he yeah. definitely is. Yeah. I think that Sorry, is accurate. That's way too modern. We should not keep that in. No, yeah, that's we absolutely should cut that. That's after two thousand. Everyone uh, forget that you just heard this. <laughs> Um, and then this other guy, King Oswiu of Northumbria. <laughs> I'm going to laugh every time you say so, it. I'm sorry. <laughs> so King Oswiu, so North, and it's important to say uh, Northumbria at the time, so this, again, for people not in England, this is the northeast bit of England, basically, at the time. And it, and it, and it uh, actually encompasses territory all the way up into sort of southeast of modern Scotland. And really throughout his life, he's been part of this ruling class in Northumbria who have just been bullied and harassed and attacked mm. by Pender their entire lives. Aww. Well, I mean, with um, a name like Oswiu, that's 
sort of, yeah. it's a given, right? Yeah, his parents really screwed him on that <laughs> yeah, one. Well, we'll did. come to his parents in a moment. So, so, and and they they did somewhat. Um, so the Mercians have really been playing this expert game, kind of like this classic uh, game of trying to divide and rule uh, and keep Mercia separate. It had two sub kingdoms called Benicia and Dira, and and Mer- the Mercians game was trying to trying to split Northumbria and keep it from you being united. Mm. And that was kind of what they were trying to do the whole time. And in order to try and do that, Pender fought a number of like major campaigns against Oswiu's family. And in doing that, his big ally was was the kingdom of Gwynedd. And Gwynedd is the uh, northwest bit of, of Wales. So it encompasses like Anglesey, okay, yeah. Snowdonia, the company, the surrounding areas. And he'd engaged in two or three campaigns uh, previously. So Mercians plus the kingdom of Gwynedd to go and like have a go at the Northumbrians and to keep them smacking That's a long way to down. go. North, like north <laughs> yeah. of Wales to Northumbria. Yeah, especially when it's you're like- talking about like carts ox yeah. drawn carts they didn't even have the what's they didn't the, what's have the motorway then the M- a1 <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it wasn't there at all no m yeah. i don't think it was um so yeah so it's an extremely long way to go and i don't really know what was in it for them and the gwyneth are like they're kind of a fascinating people as well because they the king the king of that throne or, or the the sorry the, the king of the gwyneths also had the title of king of the britons which oh. is quite a cool title so you had this marry marriage between this this person who just said who said, claimed that he was descended from woden and the king of the Britons so both these like uh, original non-Christian kingdoms trying to attack the Northumbrians and only 10 years before this time Penda had gathered together enough allies to try and raise a big army and had beaten Oswiu's dad Oswald at the Battle of Maserfield and because they, because mainly just because they were so outnumbered so massively and then Penda somewhat unfortunately has uh, Oswiu's dad mm, dismembered Ooh. Um, Ooh. On, on the battlefield which probably isn't the kind of thing like, you forgive that quickly no, no, no. Uh, yeah that would sting for a bit that's a bad day out in Northumbria yeah <laughs> yeah so, so this is what's going on at this time that we're interested in and then only a few years later in in 655 it all kind of comes to a head so Hender had spent the previous few years and the year that we're interested in uh, g- gathering his allies together to try and um, conduct a final campaign to wipe out the Northumbrian ruling class and he'd gathered some angles together from uh, modern day Stanglia and and his pal- pals from Gwynedd and he marches on Northumbria with a with at the time was like a pretty massive force so probably difficult dozen, to say three dozen <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> couple of donkeys well it's, it's it's very difficult to say exactly the size of the thing but probably something like five or six thousand people that, okay. that's sort of the size of the kind of the, of the force you could gather together at the time uh and he totally outnumbered the force that oswiu could muster which is probably about a thousand maybe a bit less but at last the you know, pender's luck is is about to run out so he's had this massively successful career dominating everyone before him oswiu uh, has had to live with the ignominy, ignominy and shame of ha- being beaten again and again by the mercians but then pender's ally from gwynedd deserts him Ooh. and refuses to turn up mm. and so oswiu is still outnumbered but he suddenly has like a fighting chance uh, and he picks his ground to stand and fight and he picks this area just in front of a, so- a swollen river which is just outside uh, modern leeds and finally uh, he does what his what his father and his uncle before him before him couldn't do uh, keep their arms and legs <laughs> <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> <laughs> Just keep your arms loose, and he stands his ground, and then Pender's warband falters first, and then it uh, turns around, and it flees, and wow. the uh, and about f- four or five hundred of Pender's remaining troops then drown in the river behind them as they're spread because of the panic Ooh. they're spreading Ooh, through. That's the Odin's revenge. <laughs> it's Odin's revenge. <laughs> <laughs> and he, and then he completes his victory by marching all the way to Grinnedd and defeating their army as well. Oh, wow. And then re-establishing this period of Northumbrian dominance and avenging his father. Is nice. this why everyone in Northumbria still believes in Thor? <laughs> is, this, is, this, is this why this is? This is true for anyone listening. Everyone in Northumbria, massive pagans, love a bit of Odin, Norse mythology, all over it. Wow, you've offended a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> Not least of all, Odin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then, and then the main so, the main sources at the time for for most of this, or one of the big sources, is Bede. And is what? Oh, the Venerable Bede. The Venerable Bede. Oh, correct. I said Mead. I'm like what? <laughs> huh. And, There's and, probably a bit of that too. Yeah. And 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 Bede, Bede basically loves all this because this is you know Pender descended from Woden and an Angle and teaming up with the king of uh, the Britons who, uh, against these like newly Christian Northumbrians. So for Bede, this is you know the the, the Christians winning out against the pagans. You know that's oh, okay. and that's how, which is kind of exaggerated because actually Pender allowed 
people to be Christian in his kingdom and he didn't yeah. have like enforce any, any any particular religion that sort of thing but anyway this this battle which is which became to be known as like the Battle of Winwade was what then beca- like, became one of the most significant battles which is kind of forgotten now really I yeah. think in, for most Brit- British people but it's one of the most significant battles in, Br- in British history really because it demarks the demi- it, it marks the demise of uh, of Pender who was a very dominant figure yeah. and would otherwise have probably gone on to dominate for, for many years to come and then it also marks the end of of paganism in the ruling classes yeah. and establishes Christianity as a religion, and then and then Oswiu goes on to like <laughs> um, to sponsor- change his name immediately now that he's got the <laughs> yeah. power to do so. Oswiu changes his name to Dave. <laughs> King Dave, <laughs> and then Dave goes on to sponsor uh, the, the what was called the Synod of Whit of, of Whitby, which was again one of these forgotten things. But that basically linked Christianity at the time to the Roman to, to Roman Catholicism, uh, okay. and which of course has remained established for like another nine hundred years. So in a bunch of different ways, it was quite a pivotal event in English history of the time. Wow, that's well done, Dave. Yeah, well done, well Dave. Done, Dave. Yeah, good. boy done good. Boy, <laughs> yeah. Northumbrian boy done good. Northumbrian boy done good. <laughs> wow. Odin pleased. <laughs> I'm excited to hear what you have. Well, I I hate to break the trend uh, because I do have to say that mine has nothing to do with Odin, which is unfortunate. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. I'll try harder next time. Um, but if we fly down south to Egypt, uh, I want to talk about a very important peace treaty. Um, so a very brief history of Egypt up until this point. Obviously, the ancient Egyptians had been there since 2500 BCE. Uh, in 30 BCE, the Romans took over Egypt and reigned for roughly 700 years. But as you both have talked about, the Roman Empire starts to crumble during that time. Um, and they, uh, in 639, the Arabs came out from the new Rashidun Caliphate in the Middle East uh, to spread Islamic rule, and they set their sights on Egypt. And so for seven years, they fought the, the Byzantines, which is what the Romans had become, for control of Egypt. And in 646, they won, and Egypt was brought under Muslim rule. Uh, the Byzantines put in a tiny bit of effort to get it back, but mostly gave up within about a decade of the conquest because, you know, they had bigger fish to fry. Um And concurrently, there's a long history of Christianity in the region, specifically the Coptic Church. Um, There were many Coptic Christian kingdoms south of Egypt in Nubia, and one of these was Makuria, which is present-day northern Sudan. And in 651, the Muslim army coming from the north attempted to conquer it. And the historical record gets a little iffy here, but most most historians agree that the this Arab army probably got defeated at the Battle of Dongola, um, and uh, they realized that the region would be harder to conquer than they thought. So instead of trying to conquer it, they introduced a peace treaty, which is what a tactic! We'll come here to conquer you, <laughs> fail yeah. on a peace treaty. Yeah, exactly. No. <laughs> and, Get out. and a peace treaty that actually put some kind of like. Even though they had lost the battle, they were definitely the dominant force in this peace treaty. Um, so it was called the BACT, the B-A-Q-T. Um, and I have a couple of BACT facts. <laughs> <laughs> so uh-huh. <laughs> yep. the first is that it, the word itself either comes from the Egyptians term for barter or the Greco-Roman term for pact. But conveniently, if you put those both together, a barter pact is a back. <laughs> yeah. Good. I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrong, but I'm going to say backed like Bacto. Rodaldo and <laughs> Oswego or whatever his name was. Uh, and the backed lasted for 700 years, which makes it possibly the longest lasting treaty in all of oh. history. Wow. That's, really? Yeah. 700 years. That's incredible. Yeah. What did it say? Like, what was the terms of this? Yeah, so there's uh, there's no extant copy of the treaty, so everything... It's very easy to comply with a treaty <laughs> when yeah. there's no copy of it. Yeah, exactly. Dubious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, everyone just sort of agrees on the vibes of the treaty. Um, so, yeah, later historians saw copies of it, you know, uh, but they're a little spotty. But there are some trends that people think it did include, including some big ones like um, the Arabs would not attack Nubia 
and the Nubians would not attack Egypt. But the Arabs had no obligation. Those are so those those are your classics, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, those are your yeah, peace yeah. treaty. Those are your classics. sort of peace treaty yeah, 101, yeah. right? Yeah. We're let's not fight each Gonna other. Gonna build on that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but the Arabs had no obligation to protect Nubia from attacks by third parties. So it was like it's just like a neutrality role yeah, and a exactly. mutual defense treaty. Right, exactly. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. not an entente. There was it's no Article a, nine or whatever. No, yeah. no, no. It's just yeah, exactly. It's I won't mess with you, you don't mess with me, full stop. And, nice and simple. Uh, yeah, there were a couple of other things that are some quite, I think, modern concepts or seemed pretty modern to me. So uh, the citizens of the two nations would be allowed to freely trade and travel between the two states. Uh, they'd be guaranteed safe passage while in the other nation. Uh, so a little bit of a like a, you know, a modern EU free yeah. movement situation. So this begs the question, when did Nubia exit happen? <laughs> new, new exit. New exit. Yeah, uh, new I will. I will. <laughs> though I didn't use that term, so the, I'll get there. <laughs> Forty million pounds per day for the Nubian NHS. Yeah, exactly. Or whatever exactly. the claim was. <laughs> A lot of buses driving up and down the streets of <laughs> Makuria. Um, and then, unfortunately, this being six fifty two, uh, there are some sort of less modern things in the treaty for instance the nubians had to pay uh the muslim rulers in money but also they had to send 360 slaves per year up to egypt but the egyptians had to send the nubians wheat and lentils um so, so not right. a not a fair trade not, not a great <laughs> at not a all great trade yeah um but yeah so that was that was the case um i didn't know that egypt was lentil rich you know, oh, uh, an inc incredibly really? lentil-rich society. Now that, Still. I think about, now that I think about it, I don't really know where lentils actually come from. Yeah. Are, just, are they not like just like smaller, more polished potatoes of some sort? <laughs> I think that's right. I think that's smallish, some smaller, sort of more polished potatoes. Pulse version of wheat, maybe. I don't even know. Well, God, those are two really challenging culinary concepts to think about. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm going into very the depths of how... Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'll do some research next time to yeah, tell yeah, you where please. lentils come would you, from. Would you come back to us, please? Yeah, yeah I will. Please, I will. Yeah, yeah. Follow us on Twitter for knowledge of what <laughs> lentils are. Um, but yeah, so this this treaty was kind of unprecedented during the, this great age of Islamic conquest of North Africa and into Europe. Uh, it was not perfectly adhered to, as you can imagine, something lasting 700 years. There were some wobbles, let's say. But there was actually a fair bit of compliance between the regions, even when power transferred in the different kingdoms um and i liked this story at one point one of the rulers of makuria was very far behind on payments uh and they ended up sending the prince of the kingdom all the way to baghdad which was the center of the the caliphate at this time to negotiate a deal for repayment uh which was successful they successfully got 14 years of back taxes wiped off the books and readjusted the payment schedule so you know and this is the payment in slaves uh and i think money and i think money. there was okay, both yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah i think was there the, was both. Were the lentil and wheat still flowing this whole time oh yeah the okay. lentil i mean the lentil must the flow the lentil must flow <laughs> the lentil must <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there's a, just a nice little bit of ancient tax bureaucracy for you there. Um, and then to answer your, <laughs> your earlier... There was a, there was a rebate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, to answer your earlier question about New Bexit, um, Mercuria collapsed in, a, in the 13th century. The Egyptians continued to insist upon payment by the successor kingdoms in the region. Uh, and then it finally ended in the mid-14th century with the complete collapse of organized government in Makuria, which but, does make yeah, it hard yeah. to That'll do it. make tax payments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was pretty emphatic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No government, no payments. Um, but yeah, that was the 700-year treaty. The back. Oh, backed. Yeah. The back. Signed in 652. Barter pact. Barter pact. Bar barter pact. This, I mean, I'm going to use the word backed in everyday... Uh, I'm just going to go for barter pact. Barter pact. <laughs> just more clear. The pact. Um, that's yet another part of history I literally knew anything about. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't know much about it either. Uh, and, and now I do, which is great because I have a deep and abiding interest in ancient Lent tax law. Lentil futures. And lentil futures. <laughs> lentil pasts, even. Hmm. And more homework to do before you come back to <laughs> yeah, us. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ancient grains research. <laughs> you, you assumed a lot of knowledge there on what lentils are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was unfair of me to put that burden on you. Please lower the bar. Acknowledging that. <laughs> Acknowledged.
Well, thanks for joining us. Um, that is, I think, everything you need to know about the year 652. If you have any questions, comments, uh, redactions or changes, please find us on Twitter or visit our website at randomlygeneratedhistory.com. Yep, and that means it's time to choose our next year. So, Will, can you please boot up the random number generator? It is booted. (laughs) And uh, as a reminder, uh, we've set the random number generator to choose a year between 1000 BCE and 2000 CE. And our next year is... Oh, no. 1471. Ooh, Ooh, okay. 1471. 1471. Off the top of my head, knowing nothing about that year, I'm going to say Shakespeare was born You're then. too early. Oh Little- yeah, that's probably about right. <laughs> yeah. I guess we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tune in next I time. Think, I think you're too early. Yeah. <laughs> see you next time. <laughs>